by these birds and we started chasing them, you know, oh, there, there's the cardinals and oh. what are they doing? And, you know, we saw river swallows and there's all kinds of birds that we, we even saw some swans uh, on the river. So it, it's a great place for, for seeing yeah, birds. Yeah, and I can see, we can see the herons live across, right. yeah. live mm -hmm. all around right. the pond and egrets. Mm -hmm. and that we, we experience every day and, um, and you were asking me about how will pe can people come out and um, they we, we would be happy to try to give them a tour if they like or they can look on our uh, I have a map of a trail and ha access map at uh, uh, belmontcoalition.org oh wonderful and uh, Ellen you also host tours thank you yes yeah. we've been uh, we've hosted about 75 tours and we're willing to continue to host them. Actually, February, March, and April, we'll be having tours with Dave Brown. He's the person that assessed that book, uh -huh. and he he is a he also assesses Middlesex Bell Squabbin Reservoir, oh. and he'll be giving the tours. So yeah. you really can just we can share that. Uh, yeah, code. I'll put uh, when every tour will uh, we announce on our Facebook page and on our web page. Uh, the Facebook site is called Save the Silver Maple Forest. And um, so we have had tours where nobody showed up. So when we know that people are coming and advertising and want to have it, then we'll have Dave come out, and he can. He's 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 fantastic. He really sticks to the wildlife issue and doesn't mm -hmm. get off too much into all of our difficulties and complexities. Out there. Yeah. Well, that I think that sounds like the whole uh, goal, or one of the goals, is to make it an enjoyable place for people to uh, uh, hike through and enjoy. So uh, that's, uh, thank you for telling us uh, that. Uh, now let me turn to another question, and Stephanie, I'll direct this to you. What do the residents of Belmont stand to lose if your case is not overturned? How would you oh, describe that? We have that? a lot to lose, actually. Um, I think number one is the we're, we're going to lose the wildlife habitat for sure and also we have ma many concerns other than the flood concern we also have traffic. The traffic is horrendous in Belmont I'm sure everyone would know that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it usually I remember before the LY station when it was before the LY station started um, it usually takes me about less than half an hour to go to Boston. Now it takes me close to 50 minutes to go where I work in Cambridge mm -hmm. which is about half of the distance and you just sit in your car bumper to bumper and I'm sure everyone experienced that and you're gonna add another what 600 residents mm -hmm. in the area and you know how bad it's gonna be. 600 residents is what or the maybe plan more, is? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's 300 right. units. Right. 300, 300 units, units, right. So mm -hmm. at least right. 600. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. huh. right. So it could even be double that, or almost double that number of cars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everybody right. has two cars. Does anyone have any sense of what would happen to wildlife if this uh, project is uh, completed? I mean, we, we would obviously lose a lot of, of wildlife, and often what happens is that, you know, there's still some habitat left, but if, if it becomes too small, then, then it's particularly the larger mammals and, and some of the nesting birds will no longer be able to, to really make a living there. So uh, it, it almost it's always leads to some extinction of, of species in the, yeah. in the area. Mm -hmm. There was at the DEP hearings, four days, 28 hours of DEP hearings. With DEP is the Department of Environmental Protection, and it's a state. Mm -hmm. Okay, excuse me. Go ahead, Ellen. And we had um, the Fairbairn, uh, Patrick Fairbairn, who was with Norman Doe Associates, extremely well known mm -hmm. and uh, outstanding assessor, who said exactly what Quentin said that. Uh, it's a very rare square habitat area mm -hmm. where the length across it is very unusual. It gives some of these mammals a place to den mm -hmm. and to burrow. So with all the dens and the burrows, it is, it's, when they put the house, the housing unit, right in the middle of that, it really stops all the reproducing areas. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get a tremendous amount of disbursement and probably the death of those species that won't come out there. Mm -hmm. The otter, for example, it's isolated. It's isolated between Little Pond, uh, the Route 2, and then the big office park. Mm -hmm. So you don't get the feral cats and the feral, and you don't get the dogs. Mm -hmm. It really is a somewhat protected area already. Mm -hmm. So I call it a wildlife refuge. 
It yeah. really is a wildlife refuge. Yeah. It is. It sounds like it's already a housing project for the animals. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's move to another question. This is a, I think, directed to all of you. Uh, how do the Belmont, Cambridge uh, selectmen and council feel about this? What are your perspectives on that? Quentin, why don't you start? Sure, sure. Uh, particularly in, in the city of Cambridge, uh, where, where I'm most active, uh, the city council has voted numerous times to preserve uh, the Belmont uplands and the, and the Silver Maple Forest. So it's very clear from, from the legislative perspective and, and the people uh, people's representatives of Cambridge that we want to protect this wildlife area and also that we want to protect it for the benefits to to all of us who live in this area. Cambridge is very active right now uh, as Ellen mentioned in preparing to adapt to the climate changes that are coming. Uh, we are preparing to study very carefully and extensively what our vulnerabilities are and how we can protect ourselves against those. And it's, it's quite obvious, even before we do all these studies, that having this kind of uh, area available to help us absorb some of the, the water flow that we expect is going to be very beneficial to us. Also, we're going to experience species migration and, and extinction of, of different species, unfortunately, as the climate changes. So mm -hmm. any kind of habitat that we can provide and preserve will, will help mitigate some of that. Okay. Well, in Belmont, the selectmen in 2004 voted against any development in the Belmont uplands. And then in 2007 and 2011, there were, uh, two, there were two bills about trying to get the state involved with purchasing the uplands, and the selectmen both times wrote letters um, to support that. So. And what, may I ask, happened to those initiatives? Well, they, the <laughs> bills, they uh, were sponsored by Will Brownsberger, and the entire legislature uh, voted for it. Uh, but the first time, the, the Governor Patrick vetoed it, and the second time, he just uh, pocket vetoed it. Why <laughs> did he veto it? Do you have any idea of that? Yeah. Well, yeah. One one reason, and what makes it so difficult for us to preserve these areas in in the middle of an urban area, mm -hmm. unfortunately, is that the land is very expensive. So the cost per square foot is very expensive, and and the state is of course very aggressively purchasing land for preservation. But it's much cheaper to do that uh, further west in in the state of Massachusetts. So it makes it very difficult uh, if if they're just looking at you know acres per dollar to spend that money on, on these smaller uh, urban, urban wilds. So that may be one of the reasons why, unfortunately, the governor decided not to fund that. Yeah. Does it have, oh, go ahead, Ellen. I was just gonna say our argument is clearly that even though this is the case, that when you have the rare open space that we do, the mm -hmm. urban wild, that it's much more valuable to uh, purchase that that, that will be used so tremendously by school groups and by learning mm -hmm. in universities and by the animals. It has much greater value, both um, environmental and economic, and that people will put, spend more money to live in areas like that that have the open space in the natural area. We have not paid for studies to prove that, but it seems to be a very clear uh, it just it seems to be very apparent that this is the, should be the case. Yeah. Well, it surely adds to a quality of life, uh, right. it seems to me. Um, does anyone else? I yeah, in the, in the summer in the Winbrook neighborhood, if you look at what the open space and our experience is that you can go to the elementary school and you have a lot of fields right with sun going right on top of you, but you, you know, the, you, the residents can just go across the pond and enjoy the forest in the summer to cool down. Mm. So it's a, it's, a very, it's a unique kind of open space for that neighborhood. It, it seems that uh, the Belmont uh, School Committee would be very interested in hearing your, uh, what you have to say, it be, particularly because it seems like an educational opportunity. Let me, let me, I think we're coming to the close of our uh, uh, half hour, so let me ask uh, one more question. And uh, 
Ellen, how do, you, uh, how do our legislators feel about it and what have they done? I think you've addressed some of that, but if you could possibly elaborate on that. The legislators, including the 30 or so Mystic River Watershed legislators, have been completely supportive of our side. Mm -hmm. They're not involved in the court case, but they have been involved in the two bills you mentioned, Quentin. Um, and, and they were both passed by the House and Senate fully. Mm -hmm. So they're behind it. And then in uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, we're doing another impact study for the legislators to see what the issues are we've discussed today on the panel. Mm -hmm. But they, they'll be looking at a professional hydrologist view. Horsley and Witten firm will be presenting the um, the different papers, the different reports, scientific reports, that were not really taken into account by the judge at the DEP hearings. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be presented again uh, to the legislators on February 14th. Well, it sounds like uh, I'm sure you hope there's a happy Valentine's Day uh, uh, next February. Uh, one last question is, and why don't I, any closing remarks each of the panelists would like to make? We only have a short time left. So, Quentin, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, again, from my point of view, it's, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to preserve a unique area that is, is part of our urban experience. It allows us to, uh, especially our, our youth, to really experience the wilderness closer to home. Uh, and that's an opportunity that unfortunately is vanishing uh, everywhere. So we really need to take advantage of that. Okay. okay. Stephanie? Yeah, Belmont has um, less than 2% open space, and we should try our best to have this, um, to preserve this um, habitat, well, well up habitat for the town to keep our small town appeal. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm hoping that Belmont, Cambridge, and Arlington will see some of the points we've made today and uh, continue to, to tell their selectmen that we they should get behind this and our counselors as well to do it in a practical and legal way. Indeed. I hope that people uh, go on our website and contact us if they want to uh, find out how they can help. Uh, we can let them know if there's anything they can do. Okay, well thank you. I'd like to thank all our panelists today for the insights and informative information they've given us and also to mention that if you have questions or concerns you can email uh, them at www.belmontcoalition.org and uh, they will answer and get back to you. I'd also encourage you to visit those websites for upcoming events. It sounds like uh, some wonderful political issues are uh, involved in this and again I would like to thank our uh, panelists and uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, effort. Bye-bye.